talks about uh, the Old Testament stories and the Bible stories and so on are uh, explanations to us. They are examples to us. We are to learn from them. And one of those stories that I like well is a fellow by the name of Nehemiah. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Nehemiah, or I'll show it on the screen here. The title of my message this morning is, Believers, Stop Being Wimpy and Fight Back. Amen? Amen. Stop being wimpy and fight back. It seems like we just want to give up too easy anymore with the Christian walk. It gets a little tough, and uh, we're ready to throw in the towel for some reason. Well, I don't believe that's what God wants us to do. Let me give you the setting here. Then I have a number of verses I'd like to share with you if I could. First of all, Nehemiah, because of Israel's sins, Israel's been forced into captivity by her enemies. Uh, He, even though in captivity, climbed the ladder and he had become the king's cupbearer. And uh, that was a very privileged position there. It gave him great responsibility. Of course, he would test the wine to see if there was any poison in it, (laughs) but uh, he would do different things. He was always with the king in public. Qualification, by the way, as I was looking at that for a cupbearer would be he had to be handsome, cultured, knowledgeable in the king's court procedures, able to converse, to advise. He had the right to be able to uh, be loyal, and that was without question, high character, and have influence. And Nehemiah had risen to that even though he was in captivity, and as a result result of that, he was greatly rewarded. Earlier on, there were a handful of Jews, Ezra, a number of them, who went to Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem. And uh, they saw that. And then uh, Nehemiah was home and his brother, and some of these Jews came back from Judah. They came back from Jerusalem, and uh, they talked to Nehemiah. And they told Nehemiah what was going on from and in Jerusalem and how the walls were down, a lot of them. Uh, The gates, they had all been burned out. They had no protection or anything like that any longer. And uh, the city was a reproach. Uh, There was a remnant of Jews living there, but they were under hardship and difficult times. They were mocked. They were always saying, where's your God? Uh, You know, if you had a God, would he allow you to be like this? defenseless, second-class citizens, on and on it goes. And when Nehemiah heard this, he wept, he mourned, and then he prayed. And he prayed and he repented of his sins, but also he repented of Israel's sins. He really cared for Israel as each Jew should have. Psalm 137, verse 5 and 6 say this, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, Let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Jerusalem had a special special place in the heart of the Jews. Matter of fact, Daniel and the other captives uh, in captivity, when they prayed, they'd always face Jerusalem. It was that so important to the Jewish people. And so Nehemiah, he's told this news, and he knows something has to be done. He knows he needs help from man, but mainly from God. One day, the only day that states he was always joyful as a cupbearer, but one day the king noticed Nehemiah's countenance. It was down. He was burdened. And the king asked him, why are you down, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah then begins to explain, begins to share what's happening in his old country of Israel, especially Jerusalem, how the walls were down, the gates were burned. As a result of that, and he told the king what he needed. 
And then the king, who the queen was right next to him, he tells Nehemiah something that's amazing. It showed that God was at work. And he tells Nehemiah, I want you to go back home for a while. I want you to come back, but I want you to go for a while there. And I want you to take whatever you need, building materials, rights to the forest, letters from me, the king, to send to the governors, and I'm going to give you some captains, horsemen, and they're going to be your escort back to your home there. And so in that, we see the greatness of God. We see the supernatural taking place, but also we see a king, a natural person. And God sometimes uses lost people to help fulfill in a saved person's life. And that's what was going on here. So Nehemiah, he arrives in Jerusalem. He kind of goes around at nighttime looking around the city. And after three days, he calls the nobles, the rulers, the priests together. And Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 says this, Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up, arise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. When Nehemiah tells the news there, boy, they're excited. I mean, they're happy about it. They say, Hey, we can do this. But how many of you know this? that when you make a decision for God, to follow him, to do something for God, we know that it's going to become a battlefield before it's over. And when you decide for God, automatically here comes, here comes the other people, right? 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this here, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He's out there, he's alive. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And here, even in Nehemiah, he says, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, But when Sambalat, uh, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Raven, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us, and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? See, that's the answer we get. I want to live for God. All of a sudden, we're mocked, we're ridiculed, we're belittled, we're embarrassed. That's what happened to Nehemiah and his men. I remember when I decided to go to Tennessee Temple. I had a lot of lost people that I knew. And they kind of laughed. I said, Jim Devaney in the ministry, nah, he'll be back. It won't be long, you know. And they kind of made fun of it and so on at that time. But notice Nehemiah's courageous faith in verse 20. He says this, Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. He says, okay, if that's what you want, we don't need you, you doubters. We'll do it without you. But let me just say something. You'll have no part in the victory that we're going to win in doing this, and you'll have no reward whatsoever. You know, D.L. Moody said this a long time ago. The devil never kicks a dead horse. <laughs> Evidently, Israel, some of them, were beginning to become alive with hope here. Someone said this, progress means movement, and movement means friction. <laughs> you're moving, you're going you're to have friction. God had a son without sin, but he never had a son without a trial. Oh we all go through that. 
<laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Christ was despised and rejected. Acts 2 believers were accused of drunkenness and were beaten. Paul was called a babbler, one out of his mind, and he was stoned, beaten, and imprisoned. So the question comes, how does the devil attack us by using others against us? Well, first of all, the devil, he attacks with discouragement. He tries to discourage us. Chapter 4, verse 10 says this here. And Judah, remember that name, said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. You see, these people who tried to discourage us from living for God, just like he did Nehemiah, they try to take away your hope. They try to tell you it can't be done. What's the use of even trying? And the name Judah, that's from within. So here's Nehemiah and his men, the enemy from without, and even from within his own people, Judah, are saying, you can't do this whatsoever. And here you are, you're excited about doing something. It's like a wet blanket on your fire to do something for God and do something good. There's been times in my life I've preached and I've taught We've had some great godly responses, but invariably someone comes up afterwards complaining about something unrelated to the message. And, uh, you know, you wonder, were they in the same service I was just in? Boy, God was good, God was blessing, and where were they? Didn't they hear what was being sung or being said that morning? And it, that actually is discouraging. And when making decisions to live God's way, we'll be as Nehemiah heard. It's impossible. Oh, it won't last. You'll come to your senses one of these days. Sounds like the 12 spies went out and the 10 spies who doubted. But the 10 spies who doubted, the consequences was 40 more years in the wilderness because they didn't believe. So he attacks with discouragement. He attacks with division. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 1. There was a great cry of the people and their wives against their brethren, the Jews. It creates division. You see, the devil uses people not to believe in your decision for God. He tries to force people to take sides to oppose one another. That's why Paul says they're carnal. Being carnal means they envy, they have strife and division. You see, the devil knows God blesses harmony, oneness, unity, the same mindset. They were in one accord, and that's not a Honda. Amen? Psalm 33, verse 1 says this. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Proverbs 6, 16 says this. The, these six things doth the Lord hate. And then he mentions in verse 19, one of those. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Amen. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. So he uses other people to create division among believers. Something else he does, the devil attacks with diversion. Chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. People had, the enemy had invited Nehemiah and his men to come and sit down and talk about everything. Don't build, just come and talk, stop. And I sent messengers to them saying, I, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same 
manner. He tries to get you off track. God shows you the path you ought to walk in, and the devil does his, bat, his best to get us off course. Huh? You know, Galatians 5, 7 says this here. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Hey, you're doing great. What, what turned you the other way? What got you off course? I remember years ago uh, when Jerry Falwell was president of Liberty University. And he was very political for a number of years until finally he came to the point. He said, uh, and they had a, it was a Sunday night church service. I'll never forget it at, at Thompson Road Baptist Church there in uh, <clears throat> Virginia there. And I remember he said, I'm done. I'm just going to focus on the church and the school and love you people. And there was a spirit there. And people came forward and started praying. You could sense the presence of God. And here I am watching it on TV. You could sense that. And do you know it was the very next week that the PTL club with, you know, the goofy ones. What are their names? <laughs> Tammy Faye. God help us. So, uh, but yeah, and he wanted all those phone numbers to be able to call out. And so he got off course, and he, it was never the same after that. The devil is very, very shrewd. Also, the devil attacks with false accusations. Chapter 6, verse 6. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. That's just a false accusation there. You know, in the church, we've been, you know, whether it's Emmanuel or, or here or whatever, oh, you're going liberal. You're becoming worldly. You're becoming charismatic because you worship and praise the Lord. They've said a lot of good things about me too. Oh, you're a dictator. You're immoral. You've compromised. You're in it for the money. <coughs> you're a cult leader. <laughs> yeah. First Peter 3.16 says this. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation behavior in Christ. Amen. You know, people would rather believe a lie than they would the truth. Yeah, that's just a fact. That's human nature, isn't it? And then the devil attacks with criticism. Chapter 4, verse 1 and following. But it came to pass when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, angry, and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria, half Jew, half Gentile, and said, Why do these feeble Jews, what do these feeble Jews do? Fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end of the day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps? of the rubbish which are burned. Now Tobiah the Amorite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down the stone wall. <laughs> Always criticized. Oh, it won't be anything, and so on, and so on. Nehemiah and his men were laughed at, considered weak, wimpy, unrealistic, and what they were trying to do. It can't happen. And by the way, let me just say, it's always been that way. David was criticized by his brothers, criticized by King Saul, and even criticized by the giant Goliath. Eh? Christ was criticized too many times to mention. Paul was criticized by the religious Jews, the lost people, and a lot of believers. We will always, because of our lifestyle, 
because of our standards, because of our priorities, because of our love for God, we will be criticized. That's just automatic. They hate us because they hated Christ. Now, the question comes, and I'm coming down the stretch here. How did Nehemiah handle these attacks? What did he do? And I've said this before, it's not deep. It's very, very simple. Three little simple things. One, he prayed. He prayed. Nehemiah 4, 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. There we see when we're doing God's will, it's not wrong for us when we're being attacked by others to turn it back on them because they're trying to hold us back from God working in our life. And we have the right to say, God, you get them. Amen? Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. Ah, you didn't receive that very good. There are times we should show some holy anger. No longer too passive, too complacent or gracious. Hmm? Paul said this, 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. So the Lord reward him according to his work. Give it back to him. Amen? David said this, Psalm 139 verse 19. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Kind of interesting, isn't it? So, Nehemiah prayed. Secondly, he purposed. Chapter 4, verse 6, he says this. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. There he purposed, just like Daniel. He purposed in his heart that he might not sin against God. And what he did, he determined he was going to keep going until he finished the wall and the gates. He would not stop. He would not come down from the wall. I'm not going to come down until we're finished. That, he purposed that in his heart. I've shared before, but it's so true. I was preaching at a black church over in Ohio. They had invited me over, and I went over, and the place was packed out, all preachers and so on. And I preached on Nehemiah. And I got to the point. I said, like Nehemiah, we preachers, I'm not coming down. And about that time, I stepped off the platform. <laughs> it was higher than this one. But thank God I landed on my feet. And I jumped up. You know, and old Brother Phil, he's a black preacher friend of mine, he comes running over just screaming. It was fun. We got so tickled. And I jumped back up on the platform. I said, I'm back. <laughs> what could you do? <laughs> a little pride. I'm not coming down. God said, yes, you are. <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and your labor will not be in vain. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Just stay at it. You make a decision for God. Yes, there are battles, there are obstacles, there are attacks, but just stay the course. Toughen up. Amen? And the third thing, he defended. Chapter 4, verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. 
they which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one, now get this, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. We worked and we had our weapon in our hand just in case. They defended the walls. So we see, one, Nehemiah prayed, relying on God's ability. Two, he purposed in continued determination. And three, he defended. They posted guards so the enemy could see them. It's not going to be so easy for you. They were ready to fight and would not roll over. And the Bible says for us, we're in a fight, and the only way we can handle it is to put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Amen. And that's his word, and we need to put it in our mind and in our heart. Nehemiah's team, they watched and they prayed. They were ready to do whatever they needed to do to win. And by the way, what did the enemy do? They backed off. Because they saw there was a group of believers who believed in what they were doing and knew they couldn't defeat them or penetrate them. That's some, and they backed away and allowed them to build the walls. And the lesson is this here. As a believer, regardless of the obstacles, we need to learn how to stand, to fight, and defend what God is trying to build in our lives. It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's doing a work in you as a believer. He's doing a work in me, and we can't allow these attacks to stop that work from proceeding forward so that one day we'll be able to say, like Paul, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Amen? God help us to be that way. Understand this, the gospel and the believer's life will not appeal to most people, will not appeal to the majority. Believers have never been in the majority. That's just a fact of history. The cross is an offense to lost man and the cross life that the believer lives is an offense to them. And so I say to you this morning, just stand for Christ. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they cried and they hailed him, hailed him. And just a short time later, they said, nail him, nail him. That's people. So let me close with this. James 4, 7 says this. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and what? He will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, thank God. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom the devil resists steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished by others. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, what shall we say to these things that God has done for us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? Amen? Amen. If they can get past God, we don't have a chance anyway. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We have a great God, people. And God just wants us to stay faithful to him. And as we stay faithful to him, he works within us to help us to grow stronger, wiser in scripture and understanding. We then can do something for God. And it's only as we allow that work to continue can we do anything for God. It's my heart's prayer is that we as a church not be wimps. And we're going to get hit. We're going to get hurt. 
We're going to have our ups, our downs, our difficulties. But the child of God is the B1 who stands against that and stands in the faith and doesn't waver to the left or to the right and goes straight forward. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the illustration story that's true of a fellow who loved his city and his country. And God, we're living in a day and age. We love our country. And we are, we're seeing its demise. And the only hope this country has is for Christians' light to shine. Amen. For us to be the example of a godly person. You're the only answer for sin. They never mention that on TV. But God, help us not to be ashamed of it and help us to mention it. We want you to know we love you today. We ask you to help us to be strong, strong in the faith, strong in our response when the attacks come our way. And we promise we'll give you all the glory. You're the only one who deserves it. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you received a blessing from today's service. We would love to have you visit with us in person. For more information, please visit our website at gpindy.net or contact us by phone at 317-535-3512. For more options to watch, just click On Demand on the website. Until next broadcast, may God bless you is our prayer.